Welcome to episode 14 of Breaking the Ice. My name is Rebecca. And I'm Connor, and we are your co-hosts. This week, we're talking about the internet, or rather, the lack of reliable internet connection in Nunavut. Nunavut is the only Canadian province or territory that has no fiber internet. This means that Nunavut is the only jurisdiction in Canada where residents do not have access to internet speeds over 25 megabits per second. Instead, Nunavut must rely on satellite internet. In addition to slow speeds, satellite internet is also incredibly expensive. To get 55 gigabytes per month at a download speed of 5 megabits per second, it would cost a Nunavut resident up to $400 per month, with extra fees for going over the monthly limit. This internet gap has become even more stark during the COVID-19 pandemic and it has left many Nunavut residents unable to access online services, from education to healthcare to simply following the news. Luckily, there are plans to change this sorry state of affairs. Kent Arctic Inuit Networks is planning to build a fiber optic smart cable to Nunavut and other northern communities, which will finally bring fast and reliable internet to this overlooked territory. So today we're pleased to welcome Kent Arctic Inuit Networks COO Madeline Redfern to the program. This is Madeline's second appearance on Breaking the Ice, as she was also a member of our panel on doing business in Northern Canada and Greenland in episode 12. In addition to her role at Can Arctic Inuit Networks, Madeline is also the former mayor of Iqaluit and the executive director of Arctic 360's Northern Branch, among many other hats. Now let's get to our conversation and learn how Can Arctic Inuit Networks plans to improve internet in Nunavut. Well, thank you very much for appearing on Breaking the Ice uh, today, your second appearance on Breaking the Ice, in fact. For any listeners who didn't hear your previous episode, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your own personal professional background, a little bit about yourself. I'm from Iqaluit, which is the capital of Nunavut, my home community, and my background is both in business, a variety of different uh, ventures that I've been involved with, uh, significant involvement with a number of uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, and uh, former politician mayor for Iqaluit uh, for two terms, and back in business, and now I'm the COO for Can Arctic Inuit Networks. Thanks, Madeline. I think sort of central to our discussion today um, we're going to be talking about internet and accessibility um, in the north. Could you sort of describe the state of internet in Nunavut as it is sort of now and how this sort of affects uh, the communities there? We have 25 communities in our territory spread over about 2 million square kilometers. We're the only jurisdiction in Canada that is 100% satellite dependent. And uh, so many of the other places have fiber optic, um, especially into their capital cities. So what it means is that we often have slow, unreliable, unstable, insecure, and unaffordable internet. So a lot of places in Southern Canada, you can have bundled services with your internet, your phone, and your cable, and and have unlimited and pay anywhere you know in around $100, $150 range. For us, we have uh, uh, really low data caps, so we have really low speeds. And uh, as a result, most people um, pay a, you know anywhere between 100 to 200 for a base you know package, and then you're hit with overages you know, depending on how much you're using the internet and the family size. Um, it can be just within a few days or a week or so after the month, beginning of the month that, uh, you know, you have to sort of end up having a family member who's the internet cop sort of tell family members like, stop, you can't, you know, you can't do stuff because it's it just, uh, it gets too expensive. So I run a, a business currently because of COVID out of my home and my internet overages are anywhere uh, 800 to a thousand dollars a month and then I pay extra for a, a landline and I pay extra for a cell phone and I pay extra for cable so all in all you know if I combine any all those all those for just uh, a household or two 
my uh, costs are anywhere between fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month, and I'm not doing Netflix. You know, it's not even for the most part. You're capable do, of doing a lot of uh, of streaming, and Zoom. You know, since COVID, which is the you know preferred choice of, of meeting, sometimes I can get on, sometimes I can't. If their weather, you know, is is foggy or snowing or raining, it literally, the, our internet can crap out. And this also means that when you're at the store, you'll see, see sometimes signs which say cash only. I know that uh, um, in a, a restaurant uh, was at a point where the internet went down and people couldn't even get, get money out of the ATM because when the internet goes down, it goes down everywhere. So it's, it's very, very vulnerable and very, very expensive and even so vulnerable that when a fiber optic uh, gets cut in either northern BC, northern Alberta, Yukon, Northwest Territories, it actually can affect our service uh, in, in Nunavut um, not that long ago. Uh, the service went down because of a fiber optic cut in a different province and the RCMP were issuing statements to our community members saying that if you need an emergency, um, you have to come to our detachment. And this is 2021. Imagine you, you're having a break and enter. Someone's having a heart attack. Um, someone's you know, um, finding themselves in a domestic violence situation and you literally are supposed to go to their RCMP detachment to get assistance, that's the state of, when you say, what's the state of your internet? That's the state of our internet. And so what, why has it been so difficult to bring proper internet to the North? What's been standing in the way? Well, it is costly. And so uh, there's been fiber that has been built out in the especially in the last 10 years to many parts of Canada. So uh, there's fiber now in Northwest Territories and in, in most of the communities, except a handful. And in Yukon, all the communities are connected except one. And so that's partly why um, my company, Can Arctic Unit Networks, is, is working to bring fiber optic into Nunavut um, to address some of these problems. And while LEOs, which is low earth orbiting um, uh, satellites, are starting to be deployed, OneWeb has satellites up overhead and will be in full service by November 2021. SpaceX is deploying satellites um, regularly as well. Uh, that might help the some of our communities, but again, it's... Um, it's going to take time uh, for that to work. And even the satellite companies say nothing beats fiber. You know, with respect to, uh, to the speeds, the stability, and a lot of people don't realize how integrated satellite and fiber are. So satellite companies want and need to effectively download a lot of their data that they're holding into ground stations and get that data onto fiber and move it you know, where it needs to around the world. So 99% of the world's communications happens on fiber and subsea fiber. And in that last answer, I know you started to touch on your sort of role as COO at Can Arctic Inuit Networks. Could you tell us just a little bit more about what Can Arctic Inuit Networks is um, and what you do there specifically? So Can Arctic Inuit Networks is a company that was formed at the in uh, at the end of uh, 2020. It's a Nunavut-based Inuit-led company, and uh, my role is to assist in getting the necessary funding and financing in place for the projects, to work with our key stakeholders and partners so that they're aware of, of this opportunity to help bridge the digital divide. Uh, to work um, towards uh, getting fiber into some of the remaining communities in Anatsia Vut, except one, and to Voices Bay, uh, to um, make politicians and Inuit organizations and communities aware that we also have an opportunity not just to have a fiber optic cable, which is a telecommunications infrastructure, but also to make it a, uh, at least a portions of it as a smart cable. 
SMART cable stands for Science Monitoring and Reliable Telecommunications. And what that is, is putting sensors on the cable so it's possible to uh, get real-time data and baseline data uh, on the marine uh, environment that includes pressure, salinity, temperature, currents, and with hydrophones, also noise that's within the marine environment related to either whales or ships or submarines and and then being able to benefit from that data because as I said right now it's it's a highly data deficient area. So this helps with climate change monitoring. It helps with uh, environmental marine protection. We've got a number of protected areas um, along Nanatsia route and in, and in Nunavut. Uh, it helps with knowing about uh, the ship traffic that's going through. It can also provide information to ship's captains about where the whales are because whale migration times are now starting to change in part because of climate change or shipping traffic to do things like avoid ship whale strikes. So it's pretty exciting being able to, you know, look at how to make a infrastructure multi-purpose help the military with all domain awareness, help with satellite redundancy, help with evidence-based decision-making, getting baseline data, and uh, generally, you know, this information, uh, you know, is, is necessary because we know that we're living in, an, in a place where there's dramatic changes are happening. So changes not only related to you know, climate change, but also opening up of, uh, of our waterways, more shipping traffic. Baffinland proposes to increase their shipping um, significantly uh, over the phases. And so you want, you know, good data and you want real-time data. And data needs to be sent over <laughs> a telecommunications infrastructure. It's uh, very hard to do that amount of data reliably and affordably on satellite. Absolutely. Well, that's really interesting. Um, so as I understand it, the plan is to build over 2,000 kilometers of fiber optic network, and that will be between Iqaluit and Clarenville, which is in uh, Newfoundland. Um, so what communities are going to be benefiting from this project? And how will this increase connectivity in both Nunavut and Nunatsiavut? Actually, the plan is adjusted. So we plan on building the fiber from just off the shore of Nanatsia Vut. Um, we've signed an MOU with Bulk International, which is a Norwegian subsea fiber and database company. So that's really exciting news and development. And we're able to work collaboratively for a shared portion of the route. They're building fiber all the way from Norway into North America. And they have a preference to go through Nanatsia Boot for a number of reasons. One is that they like to do social good, um, and but it still has to make sense from a business perspective. They don't plan on connecting the communities where we would. And there's also an opportunity for them to potentially build a data center in that region since they have abundant and affordable power and also it, it offers an opportunity for that region to look at uh, getting into the data, data services um, sector. So, and then we would extend our cable up to Iqaluit under phase one. And under phase two, we would look at connecting to uh, Nunavik's O-phone. So that would bring three regions of Inuit Nunangat, Nunatsiavut, and Nunavik and Nunavut and our cable would have redundancy. Redundancy is incredibly important. It means that if there's a break anywhere that you have a backup, your data travels on another cable. So, and it, and it really supports and, and protects the investments of, of those respective uh, networks. And then we would also look at having our network extend up to the high Arctic along the east coast of ba uh, Baffin Island, connecting the communities along the way, and potentially a, a connection into Nanasivik, which is a, a military port, 
Baffinland where there's iron ore. We know that there's going to be a lot more uh, uh, robotic mining and remote sensing that's, that's important and, and also for safety. And we've also costed out for potential other phases, uh, uh, connections into the Kivilik region, uh, right, understanding and respecting that the Kivilik also have a hydro fiber project that they're working on, but not all their communities are gonna be connected um, because there will be a, a, an end of that, of that um, hydro line. And also we've looked at costing out the potential expansion of the network in Northwest Territories. Uh, there's one fiber optic line currently into Nuvik. There's plans to extend uh, and uh, build a second cable from Dawson City into Nuvik and possibly to Tuktoyaktuk. And then a, a fiber optic cable that goes along the Northwest Passage connecting communities in the Katimut and including Cambridge Bay, where there's the CHARS, which is a Canadian high Arctic research station, highly data dependent, um, and making that possibly a smart cable because the sensors along uh, that route would provide valuable data, not only for climate change, but also shipping traffic as the Northwest Passage begins to open up more and more. So it's, we're, you know, letting Inward organizations and communities and, and different levels of government understand of, of the opportunity. We're focused highly on our phase one of the network, as you can imagine, um, but also letting people know that there is, you know, a really good opportunity to connect more communities and getting them off of off a satellite and uh, making significant improvements in, in, a, in an area of where people now understand more and more that telecommunications is a basic necessity. Absolutely. I'm wondering the quality of internet that's gonna be provided by these cables, is it equivalent to something that would be available in Southern Canada? Absolutely. So it would be very similar to, and, you know, because the fiber optic, the way it works is that uh, the data travels on very thin fiber optic cables. And uh, so the ability to have, you know, virtually unlimited data, fast, reliable, stable, and affordable internet is, uh, is, is it's transformative. Um, you just, you, know, you just cannot get comparable service uh, stability and cost with with satellite, not without putting significant subsidies and uh, to bring the cost down. But then you just still don't get the the reliability and and uh, and stability that fiber brings. This sort of touches on the next question I was going to ask, which is about the potential for LEO satellites, which may be coming next year. You mentioned SpaceX before and, and other companies. These are, are these going to are these companies going to be your competitors in this? And if so, what is the competitive advantage of a smart cable? As I said earlier, um, many people don't realize how integrated satellite and fiber is. And so what you want to do when you're a satellite company is to get your data off of satellites. And you want to get that onto a fiber network as quickly as possible. And so what, we'll see is, is the development of more and more, you know, satellite dishes, either ground stations, which is what um, OneWeb would effectively transfer their data down to, and then onto a fiber network. And, or SpaceX, their business model is different. They're looking at direct sales to customers rather than working with internet service providers. And, uh, you know, time will tell how, SpaceX um, will work in, in northern conditions, but uh, as I said, they are in full deployment, both companies, OneWeb and SpaceX. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how uh, things uh, work. Uh, OneWeb just announced that they entered into an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with Northwest Tel. That was announced yesterday and uh, our meetings with uh, ISPs, uh, they too have said nothing beats fiber. 
and they acknowledge and recognize that uh, uh, satellite and fiber integrated. That's the that's how it works with Northwest Tel. That's why I said you know you've got fiber into uh, the other regions and. They're keen, as, as is everyone, to see fiber come into Nunavut. You mentioned sort of the immense value of having these smart cables uh, for data collection purposes in multiple different areas. I'm wondering if you think that most cables will be smart cables going forward, if you can look at other areas in the world where smart cables are maybe more prevalent or sort of showing their worth. Uh, it depends. I mean, you have to analyze uh, what that opportunity is and the need for that data. So we are seeing that there are other places in the world, Korea, uh, other Arctic regions, you know, are looking also at the smart cable. It does cost more money. It also, there's a maintenance requirement on an annual basis for it. So I would not think that the majority of cables um, are being built will be smart cables, but uh, we're also seeing a number of dark cables or cables that uh, aren't being used um, as a primary or they've been sort of mothballed um, uh, telecommunications cables being revitalized to be um, sensor cables. Uh, and primarily moving that data, you know, through the, the cable network back to uh, effectively a, a, a server, a place where that data then can be sent to the respective clients. So, no, I, I don't see all cables becoming smart cables. Um, and you do have to look at uh, effectively like we're doing as a, a separate business case for them because they're separate customers and they're, and it's a, it's, there is value for where we plan on putting our cables, particularly through the Davis Strait and Baffin Bay um, because of climate change, because of the increased shipping, because of the marine protected areas. It makes a lot of sense for a smart cable to be put, uh, to make our fiber cable a smart cable. It also makes sense probably for the Western network, um, if that does get uh, put on rails um, through the Northwest Passage, it makes a lot of sense for that to be a smart cable. There's, because it's very expensive, um, you have to assess, is there a marketplace for it? And who are your prospective uh, customers, whether that be, environmental groups, different levels of government, in order organizations, and military. So speaking about other cables, um, from the Can Arctic Inuit Network's website, I found an example of a cable, a subsea fiber cable network in Alaska, which actually reduced the bandwidth charges by 60% over three years. Um, are you able to comment on this similar project and whether the Can Arctic cable would, would be able to expect similar results to that? So the cable you're speaking of has actually already been built. It's, it's done by Quintillion. They purchased uh, Arctic Fiber's original uh, project plans and, and their phase one did connect the communities of, of Alaska. And they do have future phase two and phase three plans, both that appear to be marine and terrestrial. Um, again, redundancy is incredibly important component of, uh, of any network and looking at where there are opportunities, customer base, can it be done on, on a business case, is there government uh, funding and support for those cables. So um, I understand that uh, having attended a number of conferences or panels with uh, with representatives from them that they're very much are keen to uh, expand their network exactly how where and when um, I haven't heard any you know firm announcements but I've also seen them uh, enter into agreements um, with satellite companies to do as I said earlier which is connecting their terrestrial fiber networks to satellite uh, to satellite companies. And so uh, they're definitely busy. Um, and, uh, you know, I expect that uh, we'll see their network expand further and further over time as well. And I know we sort of keep coming back to the, the cost of these projects and the need for different levels of cooperation and collaboration. I know you've mentioned sort of engagement with 
the communities themselves, the different levels of government and other industry actors. I'm wondering in your case, who is supporting um, this project and who are sort of the key partners um, who are playing a role in this? So we have the support of the Inuit organizations in our region. So Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated, uh, Kikitan Inuit Association, I'm in Rankin Inlet. I saw the president of the Kivilik Inuit Association. I'll be heading to Cambridge Bay next week and, and seeing if I can meet with, uh, with some folks over there. They're fully aware and supportive of our project. This helps get Inuit into an economic sector where previously we have not had much participation in. Uh, this also, you know, supports Indigenous economic reconciliation. Uh, we've had significant amount of, of government subsidies and investments into companies that provide a service and, and but they're not from our Northern Inuit regions. Uh, Inuit participation, Inuit capacity um, is incredibly important uh, component for our project. Uh, and we have the support of the Chambers of Commerce. We have the support of a number of environmental organizations, as well as community groups and businesses that are highly, highly dependent on, on data transfer. Uh, most of the companies uh, end up having to do workarounds or even governments, truth be told, have to do workarounds because you just can't send large files. So one of the companies is a, is a unmanned aviation company and you can imagine their clients, you know, it's video footage and a lot of video footage. And so in the end, what you have to do is, is save it in another format instead of sending it over the internet. And that causes delay. Um, and it definitely is not real time. So a lot of the rest of the world that has fiber can do things like remote mining and, and remote surveillance, sending large data. Uh, governments are in the same boat. I know that uh, people who are sometimes applying for uh, development permits for major projects they have to send their data on the plane, you know, hard copies or on thumb drives, because you just simply can't send it over the internet. So we have, you know, everyone is super keen to get fiber into our region and into the into their communities. I know you also mentioned sort of the cooperation with Norway uh, earlier on. Does any sort of international collaboration pose any concerns for like a national project or are these international cooperation sort of a great benefit that can increase the prevalence of these type of cables? It depends on the international actor. So Norway is effectively one of our allies and uh, is known worldwide to be uh, at the forefront on a lot of uh, Arctic innovation uh, projects. And we consider them a good and safe and stable and trustworthy um, uh, partner. However, there are other international actors or companies that uh, who may have undue political um, state interference or other uh, political and uh, an economic uh, sovereignty interest that may actually, you know, potentially put our infrastructure and our data at risk. And you have to do that analysis. You know, there's a recognition that uh, um, the, the Communist Party of, of China uh, has way more, you know, interest in, in, in some of the infrastructure uh, especially telecommunications infrastructure that um, we need to be very wary of because if they have the ability to take over or to access, you know, to take over the infrastructure and, and to shut it down puts, you know, that infrastructure at risk. But also if they have access to very sensitive data, um, you know, be it becomes a national security interest, uh, concern or interest. And so we, it's important to do that analysis. 
be mindful of who you're getting into, you know, potentially partner partnering with. And it and I get that, you know, certain companies um, offer significantly discounted services or products, but um, you have to again be wary if if you're exchanging, you know, a lower cost. Um, um, at the expense of as something as important as your potential region or your customers or your national uh, security interests. What are you predicting in terms of how much this project is going to uh, cost to complete? Well, under phase one, we are under $100 million. And uh, uh, we've got funding applications into the federal government, both under the Canadian Infrastructure Bank Indigenous Stream, as well as the Universal Broadband Fund uh, being run by ICED. We're in the process of, of, we had offered potential investment opportunities to different Indigenous uh, groups and uh, working with, with a few of them right now to look towards having them invest in, in this project with, um, you know, not only the benefit of, of connecting uh, um, this region, but also with a, with a return on investment. So we also know that once you bring fiber into any region or any community, it's, it's an immediate force multiplier. Um, it just, it's a massive boost into uh, the existing businesses being able to use applications that they can't use, you know, for things like product or service management, like our Northwest company. It helps uh, develop and foster people being able to work in that community, like in the media services, where a lot of that stuff right now is sent south. Um, so developing websites, brochures, printing materials, um, and, and even sort of our own cultural products. So we have people who are making videos and it gets sent down to Toronto or Montreal to be edited. And then even more bizarrely is that a lot of times this content is uploaded to, you know, on a server and available on the World Wide Web to everyone around the globe. And we have the hardest time accessing our own cultural content because of the quality of our own internet. So, you know, language applications and language, you know, preservation and advancement. I mean, those are really important. Being able to showcase our unique and wonderful culture, you know, with ourselves, but with other Inuit elsewhere and other people who are interested around the world. But it's, it's bizarre that we're in this situation where you know, we have the least amount of access to our cultural content. So no, it's, it's, it's going to be really transformative um, when we bring fiber into, into our region and into our communities. Absolutely, and, and as a follow-up to that, I'm wondering also what the timeline is gonna be for all this. Well, our timeline to bring uh, fiber into Minatia Vut and into Akhaluit under phase one is 2023, 2024. Um, you know, in part, there are some challenges as it relates to, there's a lot of cable being built around the world right now. And there's a limited number of companies that can uh, build the cable and, and, and install the cable. So we have to get our funding and financing all in place and, uh, and then begin quickly to start working on the design of the cable uh, and uh, the construction of the cable and then the goal and, and some marine surveys that were not gonna happen this year, but maybe next year. And then with the installation happening the year after, and then there's uh, some work that always has to be done at the, you know, the, the cable landing stations and connecting into the existing uh, networks, usually, because we're not an ISP. So we're what's known as a middle mile um, service provider or backbone. We don't sell internet services directly to the customer. We, we would have agreements with internet service providers and then they would connect um, their customers uh, to, the, to our fiber network through their, their own sort of last mile network. And I know throughout this conversation, uh, you touched on some of the barriers to implementing this project, some of those being costs, some of them being the actual logistics of putting it into place. Do you have any sort of key barriers that you think are the, the most vital to address 
Um, and if so, how do you sort of plan to overcome these obstacles? Well, we're working hard to inform and educate people and, and everyone is, is for the most part really excited to see fiber come, as I said, into a region where there is none. We can definitely, with our team of, of uh, who has decades of expertise and experience, um, get this cable in deployed and in service 2023, 2024. And so the, you know, let's just get it done. <laughs> That's what, uh, there's no reason to wait. There's no reason, you know, for us to um, see our region and our, and our communities and our people you know, having to wait another five years or longer. Um, the COVID and the pandemic has illustrated something that we already knew. If anything, it just exacerbated the problems. You know, people had to work from home. The home network is, is not the same as, uh, as uh, most employers' networks. Uh, it's people, you know, children just for the most part struggled or could not uh, connect to distance learning. Um, people who wanted to be able to attend post-secondary you know, from the north, it was, it was just difficult, if not sometimes impossible. And the costs, as I said, are just exorbitant. It's not stable, it's not reliable. So, you know, we've been pressing is that let's invest now. Let's get this project done now. There's, you know, we don't have the time um, or the luxury to wait. And, the, and there's definitely lots of federal money uh, to help invest and support the, uh, the creation of new telecommunications infrastructure. Um, and ideally, you know, we want to see the, the federal investment support in real northern and regional based and local based and indigenous owned, indigenous led and, and partnerships um, that benefit our that are benefit our communities. Um, so we, you know, we're pretty excited uh, by by this prospect. So if everyone says, which they do, that this is a priority and connecting this region, you know, to fiber um, needs to be done. So uh, Can Arctic is, is ready to, to do that now. Well, thank you very much for your time uh, today, Madeline. Uh, that's the end of our questions. But before we finish, is there anything else you think the listeners of Breaking the Ice should know about either this project, Internet of the North, anything on your mind? <laughs> I think it's uh, it's it's an exciting opportunity, and it would be a shame to you know miss this miss out on this opportunity. As I said, um, uh, so <laughs> as a, a number of people I've met recently is just let's get her done. Get her done. <laughs> That's great. And where can people go to, to learn more? Oh well, we um, are in the process of, of revamping our website, and that should be up and running in basically in the next week or so. Great. Well, thank you again for your time. We really appreciate talking to you today. Thank you, Madeline. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Bye.